The focus on the rundown this week is antitrust. How might things change under the Trump administration and what's going to happen to the recently announced actions to block uh, the acquisition of Juniper by HPE and potentially force Google to divest Chrome? We're also looking at uh, NIST's uh, potentially AI-powered uh, battery-popping technology, uh, the uh, Star Tree announcement of uh, new additions to their Star Tree cloud, Itential's uh, news from Networking Field Day, Sentinel One's State of the Cloud ransomware report, uh, cyber defense agencies telling us that zero days are commonly exploited, and finally, Lightbend becoming ACA. Welcome to the Gestalt IT Rundown, where each time we meet, we run down the IT news of the week with a variable degree of snarkiness. I'm your host, Stephen Foskett, and today, joining me as my co-host, is Tom Hollingsworth. No, I'm kidding. That's not Tom. It's Alistair Cook. Welcome, Tom. Welcome, Alistair. Welcome, whoever you are, to the show. It's always great to be here on the rundown, and of course, Tom is kind of busy at the moment, so I've had to step in for him this week, as I stepped in for you last week while you were away. Yes, I appreciate it. Uh, I think you did an even better job than me. No, I don't. I miss being here, but I'm still glad to have you. And and, and I'm 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 glad that Tom is busy. Uh, he's doing Mobility Field Day this week in a beautiful Santa Clara, California. So check that out today as well. Today is a National Children's Day and a National Peanut Butter Fudge Day. So if you have any children and any peanut butter fudge. Now's a great time to smash them up together. Do you eat peanut butter fudge in New Zealand? I imagine there's some somewhere here. But I also like that it's National Absurdity Day because absurdist humor is my favorite humor. And of course, uh, absurdity is, is a core part of my uh, belief systems and uh, my view of the world. Well, as America's um, favorite comedian would point out as well, New Zealand is an entirely absurd country. Let's take a look at some of the stories of the week. Researchers at NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, have trained an AI to detect the sound of a lithium battery that is about to catch fire. It turns out there is a characteristic sound of a safety valve releasing excess gas pressure, and this is a precursor to the unstoppable runaway uh, fire situation that happens with lithium batteries. Alistair, um, do you have very good ears? I'm not sure I would be able to pick out this safety valve popping. I certainly didn't notice it when um, I had, for, for one of my hobbies, we use um, lithium ion batteries and I had some particularly puffy batteries and they did go boom and, and go fire, fire, happily in a, a really controlled location. Uh, I didn't hear the, uh, the safety valves go off, but apparently this AI can. Uh, these researchers spent some time recording around particularly, it seems like just one or two batteries, and they could hear the sound of that safety valve going off as the, the gas release inside the battery began. And that was very clearly the, the starting point to, or close to the point at which this fire gets initiated. A um, couple of things in this, it would be really nice if, if there was a way to detect this safety valve release and then actually stop whatever thermal runaway was about to cause an unstoppable fire because as we know the these lithium batteries if they're charged you expose them to air and they will catch fire so you put some sort of fire suppressant even if it's co2 that starves them of oxygen as soon as that dissipates the fire erupts again so this is a very hard fire to put out and of course it's not just electric vehicles but also uh, cell phones the galaxy, galaxy note 7 was notorious for catching fire and uh, the safety warnings on uh, on aircraft on air new zealand as i fly uh, they tell you not to move your seat if you've dropped your phone into it just in case you split your phone open and cause a fire in the, in the um, plane so it's a big concern but it seems that this research is quite early one of the things I saw in the article that uh, was published by NIST is that the researchers didn't seem to have enough uh, recordings of these safety valves going off to properly train an AI model. And so they did some variations to the simple set of recordings they had and treated that as a larger set of data, which doesn't sound like it's actually a larger set of data. Star Tree Cloud, built on Apache Pinot, now includes more real-time data warehouse features, including pauseless ingestion. 
as well as the email-driven query optimization. You've got to love optimized queries. Uh, and an uh, evolvable sch uh, schema as dynamic data ingest occurs. Additionally, role-based access control, really important for large-scale environments and enterprise environments. So StarTree's massive scale real-time data warehouse is finding big corporate customers. And these new features ought to attract even more. As someone who's been following StarTree for a few years, what do you make of today's release, Stephen? Yeah, I, I've uh, followed StarTree for a while. We also talked about this back in May. Um, overall, you know, I think that this is a great move forward. And I think that it's really telling that StarTree has focused on the features that they have. So first off, let's, let's talk about what's new. Uh, StarTree is a, a data, data warehouse system. Um, it's essentially an external data warehouse uh, in the cloud uh, usable for uh, real-time data. Um, this commercial release includes a few new features. Um, one of the big ones is pauseless consumption. In other words, the system will never stop ingesting data uh, no matter what happens. Uh, well, at least that's what they say. Uh, it also includes a, a performance manager that tunes uh, not just SQL queries, but also uh, recommends uh, configuration of the database. And uh, it has uh, uh, the possibility to change the schema live, which is kind of cool. So for example, if your APIs are start to adjust a new data type, uh, you can actually update the schema live and then go back and um, sort of uh, fix things up in the past, but, but you don't have to be fixed uh, or locked into a fixed schema for the, the data warehouse. And of course, it has role-based access control on the table level, um, which allows you to uh, use this data, use these data warehouses in more applications. Now, all of these features, I think, tell you a little bit about uh, StarTree and their customer base. So for example, uh, pauseless consumption, well, that's probably not as important in some use cases as in others. And a uh, little birdie tells me that that's pretty important in the financial services world. For example, if you're using a data warehouse like this to uh, monitor uh, real-time financial tra transactions, uh, credit card payments, whatever, uh, you know, you can't just have the database pause and say, oh, hang on a second while I catch up. It's also interesting from a storage perspective, the way that they're doing this is essentially doing uh, asynchronous writes and flushes, which is something that in the storage world we've been doing for a long time. But of course, uh, you know, there's uh, new uh, ideas, new concepts, uh, and, and, and a new way to implement that in the data space. Um, the performance manager, as I said, the thing that I was key in there is that this is not just an AI chatbot that's like looking at what you're doing and, you know, hi, I'm Clippy, can I help you out? No, instead it's saying uh, it's, it's trained on specifics of the, uh, of the configuration and the st specifics of the SQL queries, and it can go back and say, you know, you need to change this, you need to do that. Um, this is a custom trained ML, which I really love. And, and I think that is a sign of what's happening next in the AI world. It's not just about chatbots and LLMs and Gen AI. The schema evolution, again, this is, uh, I think, something that uh, shows uh, what customers are using this product for. Uh, they can't have a fixed schema. They need to be able to add uh, new types uh, to adapt to real-time data sources. Um, Role-based access control. Now, this one got me interested because my first thought was this sounds a lot like what companies are talking about with RAG applications and AI, essentially giving different uh, people, maybe customers, maybe insiders, maybe different departments, uh, different views of a data warehouse. Now, that's not exactly what this is all about, but I will guess that that's the next direction that StarTree is taking because it seems like every company in the data space is working on RAG integration. It would be very cool to see uh, where they take this next, how they integrate it with uh, enterprise AI applications as they start getting real. And I'm going to be keeping an eye out for that as well. Um, it turns out that uh, StarTree has a uh, real-time analytics summit coming up. And, uh, you know, I would love to get over there. Uh, if you are available, it's in May of 25. It's virtual. It's free to attend. We'll throw the link in here as well. So um, check out StarTree. Uh, again, they continue to impress me. iTential has launched its automation service to streamline and standardize network automation allowing net DevOps teams to securely create, share, and execute automations at scale. 
The service features a dynamic automation gateway that integrates tools like Python, Ansible, and OpenTofu, enabling developers to build uh, automations while empowering teams to use them without coding expertise. With capabilities like role-based access control, Git synchronization, and reusable service frameworks, Itential aims to simplify automation management, reduce script pro proliferation, and uh, foster agility across hybrid cloud infrastructures. For more on this, let's kick it over to the Futurum Group's Ron Westfall, who learned more about it at our recent Networking Field Day event. Thank you. And yes, I would certainly welcome the opportunity to provide perspective on Itential's new initiative, which was certainly, I think, effectively unfolded at the most recent Networking Field Day 36. And at the core of the Itential proposition, is the general availability of its new automation service, which is aimed primarily at helping net dev ops engineers execute and securely share infrastructure automations across teams. And this is important because from my conversations with you know development teams and network engineers and so forth at you know key organizations throughout the ecosystem that includes both suppliers as certainly uh, the end customers is that automation is still fragmented in terms of you know the ability to take advantage of all its benefits on an organization wide basis. So there are automations that are implemented like in pockets, uh, you know, for example, for a specific application or a specific part of uh, the network, but it's not being implemented across the board. And you know, there's important reasons for that. It's, I think, very much tied to the fact that the technology needs to be better able to support this across the board automation for an organization's network. So what we're doing is addressing this, that is I'm seeing Itential, uh, you know, having a, a very compelling proposition that can make a difference. And this can help solve the dilemma that I touched on for net DevOps teams. They either have to give up time to administer and maintain, you know, the virtual environments that they oversee, as well as, you know, complex operational stacks that are uh, commonly uh, customized. And that is just to enable the execution of uh, their automations. Otherwise, they're having to spend a lot of time manually running scripts in response to, you know, tickets. And so both scenarios aren't that welcoming that is this is something that is causing a barrier and it's you know preventing this wider implementation of network automation now as i see it as uh, teams progress in their automation journey the challenge is to operationalize automation and uh, rather than you know having it continue to spin its wheels and alongside this is the fact that that script proliferation is you know something that has to be addressed directly it has to be taken by the horns and that certainly applies to the you know, network automation libraries out there that are either being uh, underused or they're not uh, fully expanded yet so what i uh, i think is important here is that uh, the new offering the automation uh, service is basically an enabling uh the solving of key problems and that is you know the time and effort needed to operationalize automations and also address the fact that there's no you know standardized approach to enabling uh this across network infrastructure and i think this is something that can assist enabling a more common framework for uh supporting uh organization-wide network automation plus it's you know the challenge of quite simply building resilient and scalable systems. So the Itential Cloud Automation Service is designed primarily to streamline how enterprises onboard and execute their automations. And what is key to this is that the offering has an all-new Itential Automation Gateway, or IAG, which offers dynamic execution environments for Python scripts, Ansible playbooks, and open tofu plans, which is all very integral to how you know, network engineers are going about to implement network automation. So this is important. It's already fitting into existing environments. This is not requiring you know, some painful cutover or you know, a, uh, a complete rejiggering of how uh, network engineers operate already. 
And so in my view, Attentional is gaining, I think, important differentiation by providing you know, this distinct approach to automation that creates individualized uh, temporary runtime environments that are instantly generated, single use, and are immediately available or scheduled for future use. So I think that's very important. It's reusable on a intuitive and flexible way. So that again, we're getting away from automation only being implemented in pockets or on you know very specific uh, situations. And as such, uh, this I think can again uh, allow for different contexts and timeframes to be accommodated and have that security built in. So there's, I would say, less nervousness about advancing with the automation. And I think this is certainly uh, aligning with what I'm seeing out there. Network automation is going to advance over the next couple of years due to uh, you know, key megatrends such as AI, both the AI ML uh, engines out there that have been around for years, but also Gen AI uh, capabilities, you know, quite simply chatbots and so forth that can enable, you know, uh, natural language to assist with this overall process and again, enable the streamlining it and so forth. So through, you know, Git synchronization and centralized management, I anticipate that Attential can make a huge difference in minimizing the complex configuration challenges out there. And to help matters along, it's available uh, on a 30-day free trial. So folks out there will have the opportunity to kick the tires. And also it comes with consumption-based pricing. So again, what's not to like in terms of at least looking at the potential automation service capabilities, figuring out how it can make a difference within you know, all important net dev ops environments, but also quite simply enabling network-wide automation across the organization. And that, I think, is why this announcement is so important and something that decision makers need to pay attention to. Thanks very much, Ron. Uh, it's great to have you on the rundown. Sentinel One has reported that cloud services are not immune to ransomware and are specifically targeted by ransomware groups. Poor the, uh, uh, the Sentinel One has reported that cloud services are not immune to ransomware, and in fact, they're specifically targeted by ransomware groups. Poorly secured cloud accounts can allow hackers to use cloud native encryption services to encrypt data, even in the cloud. Alternatively, cloud storage can be the destination for data exfiltration, copying stolen data from the victim network and getting it into the hands of the bad guys. Alistair, what's your response to this Sentinel-1 state of the cloud ransomware report? Well, I was interested to see that a lot of the discussion in this report was about ransomware uh, groups actually using cloud APIs to attack their, uh, their victims. So getting into the, the victim's uh, account. And the, the examples they used were AWS, which I'm very familiar with. Uh, and then using cloud services for the attack. So one of the services that's available inside of AWS is a key management service. And in the report, they were talking about uh, attackers issuing a new key, using it to encrypt data in the cloud, using the, the same mechanisms that customers use to encrypt their own data in the cloud but then disposing of that key and, and therefore making it impossible to decrypt the data. And so this is the, the ransomware attack, that the, the uh, attack actually happens through the cloud API rather than inside maybe an EC2 instance that's poorly secured. And I found that really interesting that these attackers are using cloud-native tooling inside customers' accounts to attack those customers. It's particularly interesting that a lot of the time our on-premises defense against ransomware is a failover into the cloud. Well, if the ransomware attacker has got into the cloud as well, then that takes away a lot of options for us as, as avoiding paying that ransom. The other thing that was highlighted in the report was this data exfiltration part. And so if a, a, a um, ransomware attacker gets inside your corporate network and starts to try and pull your data out so that they can hold you to ransom, that they'll, they'll disclose all of this private information that, that they've recovered from you, well, they have to get it out of your network in order to be able to then hold you to ransom. And historically, they've used network transfer tools um, possibly on, on well-known ports, possibly not on well-known ports. And 
as a security person, you just start blocking those off and blocking access to these uh, hostile locations that things are being transferred up to. And there's probably no business need to upload into Mega uh, or, or R-Sync to some remote location. But there's often a business need for your applications to talk to the S3 service. And the Amazon S3 service or the Azure Blob service, these are multi-tenant. And so the endpoints, the network destinations that you use to access S3 buckets are the same irrespective of which S3 bucket you're accessing, whether it's a business partner's S3 bucket or whether it's this ransomware trying to get data out. So it's far less likely that our security teams are going to be able to block access to this. And this is why we're seeing the use of uh, shared resource like these public cloud resources, S3, um, Azure Blob, and any of the other cloud providers, bulk storage locations, uh, as a way of exfiltrating data. It's just a holding ground for a little while. It'll be transferred off somewhere that's a little more controllable by the ransomware gangs. And incidentally, the S3 bucket they're putting it into probably doesn't belong to them, probably belongs to another victim, and it's been taken over again by the ransomware gang comes back, though, to one of those fundamental points about using cloud services. It's a shared responsibility model for security. If you're not well securing your S3 buckets, your environment, your KMS, your key management services, um, then these are attack vectors that are going to be available to bad actors of various sorts. So the best practices come back again. Set your accounts up, your cloud accounts up with least privilege and, and multi-factor authentication, all of those best practices. But it is interesting to see that movement onwards with these ransomware gangs using cloud native services. Cybersecurity agencies in the US, the UK, Australia, Canada, and even here in New Zealand, in fact, those five countries remind me of the Five Eyes uh, security as well, but the cybersecurity agencies have jointly released an advisory highlighting the most exploited vulnerabilities in 2023. They emphasize a rise of zero-day attacks uh, targeting high-priority systems, so not wasting zero-day attacks on something small, but hit the big important things. The report includes recommendations for dealing with this new world where these zero-day attacks are turning up, and it's very hard to prepare for zero-day exploits. Have we moved to a new world where the bad guys actually have the advantage, Stephen? Well, it sure sounds like it. And it really comes down to that point that it's really hard to prepare for a zero day exploit because by definition, nobody knows what it is. And that really is seen through and through this report. Now, I'm not a cybersecurity expert. Uh, that would be Tom or Krista or some of the other folks here on the Futurum team. But I have been in this business for a long time and I can read between the lines here. Now, first off, it is important. The headline there is important. Most uh, exploited vulnerabilities were zero days in 2023. What can you do about that? Well, there's a lot of uh, the same sort of um, decent advice that you would get from any cybersecurity recommendation. Things like analyzing known exploited vulnerabilities, applying patches, um, implementing secure by design practices like using memory safe languages, um, you know, reducing points of contact in your supply chain, all those sort of things. But the truth is that there is vanishingly little here that tells us how to actually deal with zero day exploits because nobody can deal with zero day exploits. I mean, that's really the problem here. Now, some of these things can be effective, uh, you know, Having your uh, systems, for example, using a zero trust approach makes a lot of sense because it reduces sort of the, uh, the blast radius of any exploit that does get through uh, thanks to an unknown zero day. But if we look at this in terms of, uh, you know, real world applications, you know, imagine if the police issued a statement saying, uh, that there are unknown ways that criminals are breaking into banks and we should all be prepared for that. Well, how exactly are we going to prepare for that, right? I mean, if, it, if, if, if we know that criminals are finding new ways to break into IT systems or banks, um, what exactly are we supposed to do? Uh, you know, if, if if and especially when we find out that that's the newest, uh, the the most common way that they're doing this, um, you know, it, it does make sense to do the basics. 
update your software. Make sure that people are using strong passwords, use two-factor authentication, um, Im you know, implement patch management, uh, you know, cut down on the number of products you're using, all of these things, they do make sense. But frankly, it's a little bit depressing reading this report because at the end of the day, what they're telling us is that the bad guys have new and novel ways that nobody knows and nobody is really prepared for. And they're using them aggressively and actively to get into our systems. That's basically that. There's nothing we can do except use best practices and be ready to react when exploits happen. Lightbend has rebranded as ACA with the launch of ACA 3, a platform for building elastic, agile, and resilient apps with a simple SDK and support for serverless and bring your own cloud environments. I saw a lot of ACA merchandise and t-shirts and so on at uh, KubeCon. So I think that the platform is fairly popular. It introduces uh, firsts like uh, cross-cloud app migration, multi-master replication for failover-free operations, and uh, guarantees against app reliability issues. It already is in use at major app uh, enterprises, uh, and ACA3 redefines app deployment, uh, focusing on responsiveness, SLAs, and being independent of infrastructure. Alistair, uh, I've talked about ACA and Lightbend in the past. What's your approach to this? Well, I'm always interested in tools that make developers more productive and allow us to reuse architectural decisions in our applications. And I think this is a, a big focus of what we're seeing in this ACA 3 release is the ability to target ACA as, as the platform and it is a platform as a service uh, and then gets more sort of portability across different clouds. And I've been talking to customers for a long time who wanted this ability to move their applications from cloud to cloud, do essentially arbitrage to find the most cost-effective compliant location to run their application. And the usual challenge is to get the most value out of one of the cloud platforms, you, you have to lock yourself into it. You have to choose to build your application that works the way that their cloud works. Uh, Acker, Used to be called used to be called Lightbend, and of course we covered Lightbend last year and in, in August on the rundown talking about the uh, Calyx launch. Uh, the ACA platform as this platform as a service includes things like the ability to have data that is uh, multi-master replicated between multiple clouds, so the same data resident on two different clouds or two different regions or multiple regions and, and multiple clouds and then have the actual workload move around between those locations without having to wait for data to move, without having changes in the latency for the application as you're moving between these. And that replication of data between different locations is really difficult. And it's there's a particular set of technologies that are used, the CRDT um, data structures, that allow data to be replicated as a, as a set of changes being sent and, and either as a, a um, just act on the data and, and make a change to it or update using this information and some sort of tracking to make sure the most recent update occurs. Uh, there's some really good technologies in there that get us away from that challenge of, of the latency, the sheer latency of going region to region or cloud to cloud. The other interesting thing that, that they're adding in here is more business and risk oriented with this application resilience guarantee. So this is new technology to be able to move this application from uh, cloud location to cloud location very rapidly. And so this resilience uh, guarantee that ACCA is offering is a really good for helping to reduce that risk to business as you're adopting new technologies. Uh, I really like the idea of using platforms as a service. Uh, in many ways, we look at uh, things like Heroku, as we saw last week at, uh, at their field day at um, KubeCon. Uh, platform as a service is definitely a way of improving the productivity of your developers. Of course, you then lock yourself to the platform that you choose. But again, you've got to lock yourself to something to get some real good value. In it. And it seems like Acker is a pretty well-liked, um, nicely independent uh, platform as a service offering that you can have across multiple clouds and now on your own uh, on-premises platform or in uh, EC2 instances in, in AWS, for example, as that bring in your own cloud. So now let's take a closer look at one of the top stories of the week, 
And this week, we're looking at antitrust. The U.S. Department of Justice is looking at two big IT companies potentially making waves for the enterprise IT space. First, uh, they're asking a federal judge to force Google to sell or spin off the Chrome browser, arguing that the integration with Google's other products, particularly Android, Search, and the Play Store, is anti-competitive. They're also looking at the proposed acquisition of Juniper Networks by Hewlett Packard Enterprise and potentially scuttling that deal as well. Now, uh, here in the U.S., there's been a lot of thoughts about the uh, incoming administration and cabinet picks and so on, but maybe uh, that hasn't uh, spread outside our shores. First, Alistair, uh, what can you tell us about uh, Google and Chrome? So the point here is that Google is huge. Google has a massive footprint around the world on on pretty much every, almost every computer that you use, certainly every one I use because it's my default browser. Uh, but I also have Google as my default search engine. I have an Android phone. And so I'm very much hooked into the Google world and Google's use of the data that it's collecting from me and, and its algorithms together can very much drive my perception of the world around me. And that's fundamentally what this is about, is separating some of that out, allowing a bit wider input into that set of information that's presented to me, but also allowing other organizations to compete more fairly in here. Even though I might continue to use Chrome everywhere, I might not just get Google's view of the world. And I think as um, we're seeing political changes, not just in your country, but also here in mine, uh, the ability to see wider views of what's going on in the world is, is fairly significant. Uh, we will have seen that uh, the, news, the international news about our hikoi here uh, to protect indigenous rights and uh, the ability to see this information unfettered and, and uncontrolled is, is really important to us. Um, the other one that was interesting was seeing the, the Juniper deal getting, uh, as I read the story, I wasn't clear whether the, the Department of Justice has said they're actually trying to block this thing or whether it was just rumors going around that were causing uncertainty and, and therefore uh, problems with stock prices moving. It is interesting that the Department of Justice is who does this for you in the US and the rest of the world's kind of gotten used to this. We remember the days of Microsoft and Netscape and uh, the, the antitrust kind of elements that, that went along around the, the uh, browser wars uh, in the past. But um, just justice seems to be an interesting place for this. Is this um, just the way the US uh, lawmaking and jurisdictions fall together, Stephen? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah, this is how it falls in there. I mean, it's important to recognize that we don't have something like the Digital Markets Act that they have in Europe. We have um, long-standing uh, antitrust laws dating way back to the early parts of the 20th century, and uh, some of them actually dating earlier than that to the railroads and things like that. Um, but it's also important to recognize that here in the U.S., um, Number one, uh, obviously the U.S. has a lot of power in these types of enforcements because many of these companies are based here and of course we're a large market. Uh, but number two, that it is very much up to, I don't wanna say the whims, but up to the decisions of the uh, people in the current administration, uh, how things are enforced. Now, part of it happens uh, from the Department of Justice at the direction of the Attorney General who decides which cases the uh, nation's law enforcement should uh, look into, which cases they should try to argue in court, and which cases and, and what remedies that they should put forward. But part of it all is also in the hands of the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC. Now, um, Biden's FTC uh, commissioner has actually drawn a lot of fire because she has been extremely aggressive in antitrust action. In fact, uh, Lena Khan is her name. She uh, has kind of a, um, a bad name um, among uh, business people and probably among the Republican elite because she has been so aggressive uh, essentially, the Biden administration literally, I mean, they signed an executive order basically saying big is bad and we should go after big. And that's pretty much what Lena Khan has done at the FTC. Now, the Department of Justice has also looked into a lot of mergers and, and so on and, and has decided to uh, allow some and, and block others. 
But uh, the Google case, I think, is really interesting because essentially this is a long running case. It spans multiple administrations. And the result, well, to my mind, it makes absolutely no sense. Um, Chrome doesn't really have any value as a standalone product. Uh, otherwise, we would have a vibrant economy of web browsers out there and ask, uh, I guess, the Opera people or the Firefox people, if that's true. Um, the truth is there really isn't uh, a, a market for uh, browsers, and it's not really clear who would want this thing other than Google. The uh, whole case, though, was supposed to be attacking uh, Android and Play Store and things like that, uh, not to mention a separate case that is looking at Google's dominance in advertising. So we do have to think about how that would play out in the minds of a new attorney general and a new FTC chair on the assumption that uh, the Trump administration would quickly change uh, chairs of the FTC as well as, as the Department of Justice. Um, and then there's the HP, uh, HPE Juniper acquisition, which again, as you mentioned, there's no announcement as far as I can tell. There's no official word here. It's just, it's just people are spooked by it. Frankly, I can't see this administration, a lame duck administration, uh, blocking a merger like that unless it was very clear that the new administration wanted to do that. And to my mind, it's not very clear what the new administration wants to do when it comes to antitrust. I should point out that uh, Trump himself, along with many of his top advisors, including uh, J.D. Vance and his uh, nominee for attorney general, have all been actually quite aggressive and, and, and proponents of enforcing antitrust actions and breaking up big companies. It's, uh, it's not entirely clear that they would want to take a different approach on this than the Biden administration. But that being said, they'll want to take a different approach to everything than the Biden administration. And so there is a good chance that they may uh, indeed uh, drop some of these cases or modify some of these cases. Uh, but ultimately, I don't see a Trump administration as being all that big business friendly. Um, what's your take uh, from your side of the pond? Well, from over here, we see... Uh that there's been a global swing towards the right in the last year or so. Same with our election a year ago. Uh, we've seen it, seen it in Europe as well. And so you would have expected that to be more business friendly. It certainly has been here in New Zealand. But as you say, um, whilst Trump himself is uh, tends to be interested in looking after the organisations that he understands that he knows, uh, that's not necessarily going to flow through into we want more larger organisations. Uh, I really have trouble predicting what the heck is going to happen in your country because things are crazy. It's crazy enough in my country. And um, I think we, we will wait with bated breath and see. Yeah, it's, it's really a strange situation, isn't it? Because on the one hand, you would think that, uh, you know, the, the incoming administration would be extremely business friendly, that they would be really doing anything they can to promote capitalism and, and big, big business. But at the same time, uh, you know, I mean, one of Trump's uh, big platforms has been tariffs, and that is extremely uh, business unfriendly. And many of the other things that he's been talking about really do point to aggressive actions against large companies. So, yeah, as you say, we'll see what happens. But I don't think it's all that obvious that uh, these big antitrust cases would go away or that they would be dropped even if the heads of these uh, organizations were to change. Now, let's take a look at some of the things that are out there the weeks ahead. Uh, first off, as we mentioned at the top, Tom's not here because he's running Mobility Field Day 12 today. Check it out on TechStrong TV or go to techfieldday.com. You'll learn more about Nile and Cisco. And I'm really looking forward to hearing what the delegates have to say as well on their incredible roundtable discussions. That's the end of the uh, schedule for Tech Field Day in 2024, but we will be back in 2025. We've got an AI Field Day event coming up in January. We've got another Cloud Field Day event led by somebody named Alistair Cook, whoever that is, in uh, February. And of course, we've got events in all of our other topics coming up as well. Again, check out techfieldday.com to learn more about that. Thanks for watching the Gestalt IT Rundown. You'll catch new episodes every Wednesday as a YouTube video or on your favorite podcast application. The Rundown is also live streamed on TechStrong TV. 
And you can often catch us on TechStrong and other Futurum Group programs, including the uh, TechStrong Gang, where I appear pretty much every Tuesday. We'll be back next Wednesday to talk about the IT news of the week that was. But until then, for myself, for Tom Hollingsworth, Alistair, Corey, and everybody here at Gestalt IT, here's wishing you a happy GIS day. 